Morena Koto, uh, kia ora koto katoa, uh, e te rangatira, ka ranga mai, mihi mai, whakatau mai, uh, tēnā koto katoa. Uh, so thank you very much, Guy, uh, for that introduction. Uh, I, I love your karakia. It's, it's the same one that we use at our board, uh, actually, so sets the scene uh, really well. Um, really pleased to be here, both uh, in my role uh, at the Reserve Bank, but also as a fellow member of the Institute uh, of Directors. Uh, and today talking about a topic that we are, are all passionate about, which is uh, good good governance. Uh, I should uh, you know, acknowledge also the, the input of, of the Institute of Directors and the help that they've provided uh, for us in this review. And, and once again, thanks for uh, bringing us all together here um, this morning. Other thing I just wanted to acknowledge was that uh, we've been undergoing quite significant governance changes ourselves as an organisation uh, here at the Reserve Bank, um, first with the establishment of the Monetary Policy Committee uh, four years ago, uh, and more recently over the last 12 to 18 months, the establishment of a fully empowered uh, board, corporate board. Uh, but today, as Guy mentioned, um, I'm here to talk about uh, our role as a prudential regulator, uh, in particular, uh, this governance thematic of the financial uh, industry that we've undertaken uh, jointly with, with the FMA. Um, so that's the main course uh, this morning of, as you have your breakfast and have your coffee uh, within reach. And, and the entree is just a little bit of background really about um, the role of governance in financial stability, actually the critical role of governance, uh, and a few of the past lessons that we've learned as we uh, moved into the actual um, thematic itself. Uh, so here at Reserve Bank Te Putia Matua, our purpose as set out in uh, the Reserve Bank Act uh, is to enable uh, economic well-being and prosperity uh, for all New Zealanders. Toitu uh, te ohanga, toitu te ranga. And you'll be most familiar with that through our two uh, operational objectives effectively, which is one is around monetary stability, setting interest rates every six weeks um, to achieve our inflation uh, target. And the other is around our role um, supporting and promoting financial stability, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, and, and the rationale for our role in financial stability is, is quite simply uh, like any other critical uh, you know, piece of infrastructure for society, um, you know, financial stability is a public good. Uh, it is one where the costs of financial instability are felt much more broadly uh, than a narrow set of, of stakeholders, shareholders, uh, and, and the like. And that really uh, prompts the role for a public policy agency to have that focus on the, um, the public uh, costs and benefits of financial stability and how to maintain that. Uh, a couple of uh, pictures from my scrapbook of, of time at the UK at the, at the Bank of England. I didn't take these pictures myself, but uh, on the left is the run on the Northern Rock Bank, uh, September 2007. And on the right is the uh, riots outside the Bank of England in early 2009 when, when London hosted the G20 meeting. So um, I guess two images that as a student of economics uh, and, and financial crises, I didn't expect to see uh, in, in my uh, lifetime, something that we thought was uh, relegated back to the, you know, the 1930s. So how do we uh, uh, promote and support financial stability? It's, uh, you know, one way to think about it is these uh, three pillars to prudential regulation that we've we've often spoke about in the past and, and many on the call will be familiar with this. Um, one pillar around uh, what we call regulatory discipline and, and you'll be familiar with that through the form of things like capital requirements, liquidity requirements, uh, our role as a prudential supervisor with close uh, engagement with entities. Uh, market discipline, which is around uh, disclosure, transparency, uh, the types of information that we make sure is available to the public so that um, domestic, uh, depositors, investors, uh, other stakeholders, rating agencies can ha have scrutiny uh, on the stability of the financial system and create all those strong incentives um, for management and, and boards. 
And then finally, uh, self-discipline, which is really around the role of uh, management and boards uh, to provide stability. And it's really hard to overstate the importance of governance in the self-discipline when you think uh, to a large part, the, the board is the financial institution. Uh, it sets the strategy, sets the risk appetite. It ensures that there are all the resources, systems, frameworks um, to, to achieve the objectives uh, of the organization. So governance is absolutely critical uh, and a key component of financial stability. Uh, and that's a, a lesson that's been reinforced uh, through time. I've just a, a short sort of potted history that I wanted to um, touch on briefly in terms of some of the lessons that we've learned over the last um, 20 years, uh, really just reinforcing uh, that point around the importance of governance for financial stability. Uh, so the, the GFC uh, back 15 years ago now was a uh, uh, I guess a real watershed moment around the importance of boards being capable of managing financial risks um, and really having that um, uh, both understanding uh, and being able to absorb uh, a, a lot of information in, in a digestible way to really lead uh, that strategy and that risk management. Uh, the Royal Commission in Australia uh, five years ago was uh, a bit of a watershed in terms of the ability of boards to manage non-financial risks, in particular around uh, conduct, culture, um, behaviours, uh, reputational risks um, that boards uh, needed to manage and focus on. Uh, in New Zealand, we haven't been immune to you know learning lessons uh, ourselves, and I've noted um, South Can the collapse of South Canterbury Finance and uh, the collapse of um, CBL. Uh, on the timeline there, and and that those lessons were uh, very much around the dynamics between uh, management and boards, uh, and the importance of having a strong board, uh, independent board voice as part of that. Uh, and I've also uh, noted there the two, um, what we call Section ninety five reviews that we requested of of ANZ in two thousand and nineteen and and Westpac uh, in two thousand and twenty one. Uh, I do that for completeness, but also just to uh, recognise and acknowledge the really strong uplift uh, in governance that, that that's brought about. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank uh, earlier this year, and I know that the Institute of Directors have uh, done a, a webinar on that as well. Once again, um, a uh, handy reminder of the importance of, of strong governance along with strong market discipline and, and regulation to, to avoid those types of collapses and the implications uh, they create for the broad, broader financial system. Uh, so the, I guess the, the prudential regulatory environment that we're familiar with it has been, a, been about for about uh, 40 years now um, since the globalization uh, of the financial system, the banking system and insurance uh, markets. But it, it's really only since the, uh, the GFC that uh, governance has had a really strong um, place within that framework. So it took until um, 2020 for the Basel uh, Banking Committee to, to put out uh, guidelines and principles for banks uh, governance as a, as a centerpiece uh, of the regulatory environment. Uh, and I've noted here on the slide the, uh, the guidelines um, that we, we've put out, both for banks uh, and insurers, uh, uh, the principles and guidelines provided by the FMA. Uh, and also wanted to acknowledge uh, the, the four pillars of governance uh, publication um, from the Institute of Directors, which I know is uh, you know, literally a Bible for, for many uh, directors and trustees uh, in the market, a much more, more detailed uh, and practical and, and thorough guide for um, governors and directors. So that's all the way, by way of background, sort of leading into this uh, governance um, thematic that we undertook. Uh, just to give you, um, you know, a slight sidebar into where thematic reviews sit within our um, supervisory um, toolkit. Uh, we obviously have our 
uh, regular engagement with with the individual uh, entities at, at various levels of the organizations. Uh, then once every uh, one to two years, we will undertake a, effectively a thematic um, deep dive uh, across the whole industry on a particular topic. Uh, and so that's where uh, this governance thematic um, uh, sits. Uh, and the scope of the thematic was to really understand, knowing the importance of governance and financial stability, just really understanding how uh, boards were fulfilling that role, um, how they were meeting these um, guidelines and requirements, uh, and really just taking the opportunity to uh, get a sense of what current practice is uh, in New Zealand and where that sits uh, relative to good practice. One of the main, you know, one of the biggest challenges in these types of reviews is uh, identifying the scope of the review. And as you all know, um, governance is a, a tremendously large uh, topic. So where we fell was to uh, focus on governance frameworks, policies, and processes. And that was really just um, acknowledging uh, the importance of those fundamental uh, pieces of the puzzle and the things that are really the foundations for a lot of other components uh, of governance. And uh, we've outlined some of those there on the, the diagram on the left, ultimately leading into, uh, you know, the, the tone at the top, the conduct and culture and behaviours around the board table. Uh, there were 29 entities in the sample across the different um, parts of the financial industry that both uh, the Reserve Bank and uh, the FMA regulate. So that gave us a really uh, a, a rich uh, flavour of practice uh, across the industry, which I think is one of the main main benefits that the, the review has provided. Uh, so just getting into some of the findings now, um, they're outlined in the report, uh, just I guess stepping back before we pick out some of the, the key topics here. At, at a very high level, um, uh, we had no material concerns uh, that, that we found in the found in the review. We, we were pleased by uh, where the industry was in terms of um, governance and the focus uh, that it was provided. Um, there is practice did vary. Uh, across the industry, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about how we're we're following that up with with each individual institution. But at a high level, uh, no material concerns. Uh, some very good area, uh, areas of good practice that I'll just pick out here, um, and that are covered in the report: uh, the independence of boards, both in in form and and in substance, which is an absolutely um, critical element. Uh, of our framework. Um, the time that boards are, are putting towards um, strategic planning, as I mentioned, it's such a core part of governance, that ownership of strategy. And what we were observing was that boards were putting uh, a lot of deliberate time and energy in planning uh, and follow up around um, the formulation and execution of strategy, which was uh, very encouraging. Um, a lot of focus on uh, and thorough uh, appointment processes, uh, particularly around uh, the appointment of CEOs, uh, very thorough and, and deliberate um, succession planning for, for senior management, uh, a really strong awareness and, and focus and, and documentation of, of conflicts of interest um, being something that boards have been um, you know, very familiar with for, for a long time now and have been able to hone their practice uh, and also, it was quite apparent that boards put uh, a lot of effort into uh, regular training and, and development of board members. Uh, in terms of areas for improvement that are that are outlined in more more detail in the report, and which motivate some of the recommendations um, outlined in the report, uh, the selection of chair, the chair and committee members was. Um, probably less thorough and, and robust than, than we had expected uh, to see. Um, again, board, board succession planning, um, not as well documented, um, 
not as well owned um, collectively by the entire board that we than we expected to see. Uh, performance evaluations uh, were part of practice in the industry, but they were um, probably uh, didn't have the, the same um, thoroughness, uh, the same, same amount of um, independent uh, input into those uh, evaluations, uh, quite informal, um, so an area that we saw thought that there could be um, significant uplift. Capacity assessments were undertaken when board members uh, started in the role, um, but there wasn't uh, nearly as much evidence that that was something that boards uh, deliberately thought about um, through time as, as the demands on, on board members uh, changed uh, through, through their various roles and activities. Uh, and then finally, the one that I'll uh, mention is uh, diversity, where um, all of the uh, organisations in the sample had um, strong um, policies uh, around diversity of their organisation, uh, but often that didn't uh, apply uh, to the board itself. Um, and so in three quarters of the, the entities in the sample uh, didn't have a, a diversity policy for the board itself. I just touch touch on a couple of reflections, um, having uh, been part of this uh, process, and and one of them is around, really around the the benefit of having um, Dr. John Laker uh, review our report. And many of you may have come across um, John Laker, um, former chair of APRA in Australia, uh, and the author of uh, many governance report, independence governance reports through time, including the the Royal Commission back in 2018. Uh, we had some great conversations with uh, John uh, as the report was being drafted uh, and refined. And one of those was really around um, best practice versus a good practice. And I think in some of the early drafts of the report, we talked about best practice. Uh, and he reminded us that actually, uh, uh, you know, that changes through time. That's never constant uh, governance. Uh, there's no finish line um, here. Uh, practice is continually uh, evolving and, and will shift um, through time. And so the best we can do is to um, identify what is current um, good practice. And uh, that's what really motivates the, the, the title of this uh, report and speech. It's not a, a slight on the industry that we're moving towards good practice. It's just an acknowledgement that that uh, will uh, change and, and evolve through time. Uh, second uh, reflection, having been involved in the report, is just uh, this point around, again, around um, the environment that we uh, operate in uh, as, as governors and trustees and directors is forever changing. Um, changing economic developments, um, geopolitical trends, um, structural factors, um, climate change, new technologies and markets, um, changing expectations on, on our organisations, on us, on the way that we're um, interacting with society um, more broadly. Uh, and that changing environment that we all operate in um, really underlines the importance of a continually learning um, from learning our lessons, embedding those, um, being ready to change and evolve into the future. So really having that um, future focus and, and that driving some of these um, key findings around um, boards needing to spend effectively more time on themselves, um, thinking about uh, the collective um, skills around the table, thinking about the diversity of uh, perspectives that's required now and into the future uh, and thinking about uh, that succession planning uh, that's required um, to be successful, not only now, but into the future uh, as well. Uh, next steps, uh, with the in terms of the regulated entity world, uh, for those um, entities that were part of the sample, uh, we have gone back to each of those with individual letters, um, setting out not only the findings for um, 
uh, the sample as a whole, but also our, our findings about our interaction with them uh, as participants in the review and um, um, follow-up actions. For entities that weren't part of the sample, we're encouraging them to um, self-assess uh, versus the recommendations, and we'll be following up with, with conversations uh, around that. Uh, at the Reserve Bank and the FMA ourselves, uh, an opportunity for us to reflect on, on what the findings mean for um, the regulatory environment that we've set and, and the, the guidelines and policies that we have in regards to governance. Uh, and for us, the, um, the implementation of the Deposit Takers Act is going to be um, one avenue uh, where that will be uh, a key consideration. Uh, and then finally, just sharing the report more uh, broadly uh, outside the financial industry, because we understand that many of the lessons, uh, I'm sure, will be pertinent to, to other board members as well. Uh, so nearly coming to an end, uh, Guy, uh, but just to uh, finish with a whakatoaki, um, ko tahi te kohau o te nera e kuhuna ai te mero mā, te mero pango, te mero whero. Uh, so this is a, a, whateo, a whateohi from um, Kingi Ototao, the, the first uh, Māori king back in 1858, and he was talking at the time around um, the importance of Māori and Crown relations and uh, the importance of connection, collaboration and a common vis vision. Uh, and so he spoke uh, of this idea of needing to, uh, through the eye of the needle, must pass the white thread, the black thread uh, and the red thread. Uh, and the idea is that those three things really needed to come together and be bound very close to provide that um, strength uh, of those three things uh, in unison. Um, but also uh, uh, what this proverb uh, tries to emphasise is that that's not an easy thing to do either, um, trying to put three uh, threads through the eye of one um, needle. Uh, and the thing I like about um, this whakatoki uh, is its versatility. Um, you know, when I think about us as a prudential regulator, uh, I think perhaps it's time to retire uh, our three pillars uh, analogy and, and replace it uh, with this, that the, uh, the, the threads of um, uh, regulatory discipline, market discipline and self-discipline need to be tied together strongly um, to provide um, financial stability. Um, in the world of governance, um, it could also be applied in different ways. Um, the threads of the, the past, the present and the future need to be tied together to, to provide um, strong governance, uh, not only now, but into the future. I mean, perhaps it's the, uh, the threads of um, culture, behaviours and frameworks uh, that need to be tied together. And I will... I invite you all to, you know, reflect on that and maybe um, throw a few of your thoughts in the comments for, for Guy as we move into the Q&A. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Kia ora, Christian. And um, I think you've um, you've brought the the report alive, and it's a pretty accessible report as well. It's not uh, not running to hundreds of pages, which is which is which is great. Um, we've really enjoyed contributing to to this both at the beginning and the end of the of the process. Um, and as you've you've pointed out, there's a there's a level of um, commonality with other parts of governance, not just the financial sector. Um, if we can just remind the uh, our audience this morning, uh, if you want to ask questions, and I'm sure there's lots of them, uh, if you use the Q and A button at the bottom of the screen, uh, we'll um, we'll pick those up uh, after we've just had a bit of a bit of a conversation between Christian and, and I. Um, we've also just put in the chat uh, the link to the report. Um, so if you want to see more detail of what's in the report, you can you can look at that as well. So just a reminder, the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, uh, really, uh, re really want to hear those questions and uh, we'll get to those in a moment. But just to, to start off, Christian, and uh, this is a really important report. What's the biggest surprise for you and the team positively in this review of financial sector governance? And, and why was that? Yeah, I, I, I think many of the findings aligned uh, with our expectations, given the ongoing relationships that we, we have and have built uh, with boards and, and directors. 
I, I guess one of the positive surprises has been, um, you know, the positive attitude that the the industry has taken in being part of this review, and that was, um, you know, very much welcome from our, our perspective. It is one that we uh, were looking to do um, collaboratively uh, with the industry, and it perhaps, um, you know, uh, picks up on so, some of the findings, which is, um, you know, the growing importance that well boards recognising um, the importance of independent external uh, evaluation and, and, the, and their openness uh, to that. Um, also, uh, boards acknowledging the, the importance or increasingly in acknowledging the importance of um, strong frameworks and policies and actually um, investing the time um, to document those. Uh, and another a positive surprise or positive aspect of the report was uh, the way that we work together with uh, the FMA, and I want to call them out and acknowledge, you know, their their part in all of this as a as a joint partner, um, and just it's really consistent with the approach that we're looking to take across the Council of Financial Regulators as as collaborate really strongly with other regulators, um, the industry itself. Uh, they want to have that um, sort of united front. They don't want to be um, having to deal uh, in an inconsistent, you know, incoherent way uh, with us as regulators. So the fact that we are able to learn a lot off each other uh, as regulators and work um, collaboratively with the industry was really uh, a positive aspect. Yeah, it's great because that's actually one of one of the questions we've had from the audience as well. So that was a that was a good start, right? Um, the other interesting thing for us, and, and certainly intriguing me, is you've got a review that actually points to generally good practice. So you say you, you don't have any particular systemic concerns around this, but you then point to sort of what I think you're saying is that it's not the boards and actually aren't effectively documenting mm. what it is they're doing. In some senses, why they're doing it. Why do you think that is? How do you think boards should actually go about that? And what's going to motivate them to do it? Because you talked before about incentives as well um, in your in, in your presentation. Yeah, and, it, and uh, it's a, gr a great question. And I don't want to kind of become an amateur psychologist around, uh, you know, what's holding things back here. But there's, there is an element of, you know, sometimes the urgent gets in, way, in the way of the important. Uh, and we would have all experienced that um, through our, you know, involvement with boards um, through time. It really is something that requires that uh, investment uh, and that investment of time. Uh, and time is the thing that is most precious for us all. It's the resource that's the most um, constrained. So really just putting aside, recognising the importance, putting aside uh, the time um, to do this. Uh, having the that that future focus, um, you know, one of the, um, you know, red flags uh, for us is that if we, uh, you know, meet a board and they're doing a lot of this stuff, but it's just in the head of one person around the table, uh, you know, that that is a, a sign that this is, even if practice is good at the moment, it gives, doesn't give us uh, a great deal of confidence that practice is going to remain um, good into the future. Uh, and for the involve the evolving uh, environment into the future, which raises some interesting questions, though. Which is what you're pointing to almost is inconsistency. You know, presumably some of what you observed was a situation where it might be you might see good practice governance in the way you've described it for a period of time, and perhaps the chair changes or board members mm -hmm. change. Is, it, is is that something you observed? And and do you think that some of what you've just described would 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 address much of that? It, it certainly um, what we observed opens boards up to that risk, um, ab absolutely, and and the findings are really around you know how how to address that and give that confidence and and embed um, things in. And as I mentioned um, earlier, um, a growing when, when we looked at uh, good practice, um, you know there was a spectrum there uh, across the industry, uh, across the different. Um, dimensions that we uh, observed and those at the the frontier uh, were, were the ones that really acknowledged uh, and recognized that importance of of documenting things well and and investing time in the board itself 
Interesting. Just picking up your frontier point, do you, to what extent do you think that some of those um, boards that were at, at that frontier, as you've described it, were they sharing that experience with with others, or was, was there any evidence of that kind of kind of sharing of experience? Uh, we we didn't uh, pick that up. I think that you know that is one of the benefits of this report that um, we have the luxury uh, of being able to see. Uh, right across the industry, and that's not what individual um, board members always uh, have that ability to to do. So, in some ways, that's uh, we know that if we put all this effort into this report, all this effort into the review, and the participants, you know, spend a lot of time with us on it on this, uh, we need to add some value here, and for them to get some benefit out of it, uh, and that is one of the key benefits that we can provide is just letting people know uh, what what good governance looks like across the industry. Um, many board members are on multiple boards, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, so uh, they will see uh, different practice in different parts, um, different boards, different um, different industries, different parts of the economy. And, and you would, you would hope that that, uh, that gets shared, you know, across and the, and the best bits gets transferred and um, embedded into, into those areas that need to uplift. Yeah, and it occurs to me part part of the role of the Institute of Directors in this is providing fora for this this kind of conversation. Hopefully, Absolutely. webinars like today's and and some some of the other material we'll produce for our directors um, will will prompt that that conversation. Um, I want to move to diversity, but first, if I can just prompt the audience, uh, uh, if you do have questions, can you put them in the Q and A button at the bottom of the screen? I'm sure Kristen would be uh, would be delighted to uh, to answer those questions. But uh, moving to diversity. Um, and succession planning. You've you've talked about succession planning processes and part of those being a bit bit informal. I think is the the interpretation I've taken out of that. Um, you want those succession plan uh, pro processes to encourage diversity and capability and background. Can you talk a bit about how you see that working and the sort of almost the gap between what you'd like to see and what you're seeing now? Yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, again, it comes back to that um, collective ownership around the board table for, for that succession planning and for that um, diversity and, and thinking about it, you know, often uh, in these reviews or in our interaction with the entities, they sort of say, well, you know, what's the answer? Tell us what the answer is and we'll, you know, we'll do it and we'll tick it off. But actually, it's more about thinking about those outcomes and the importance of succession planning and diversity in those outcomes. And then for boards to collectively own, thinking about what that means for them uh, and, and how they can deliver that um, you know, for themselves. Uh, and thinking about things like diversity, um, you know, it's not just the, the next individual incremental appointment, you know, that needs to be uh, be made in the context of the skills uh, around the collective. Um, table and how they all fit together um, and and for me it really underlines the importance of um, governance uh, being a team sport you know it's not an individual sport it's a team sport and it's really around um, how that team uh, fits together and being really deliberate uh, about that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting too. I mean, the other theme in all of this is around inclusion. So diversity is one point or you know, diversity of capability, background, that kind of stuff is one part of that. There's some work that's been done by the UK Financial Reporting Council, or at least for them, by the London Business School, which talked about some things that then go to the heart of uh, how do you promote inclusion. And one of those things is around the role of the chair. Um, I don't think in terms of your remarks today or in the report, there's necessarily that much about chairs apart from the appointment processes. Do you have a perspective on that? I mean, what the, how you see the role of the chair in terms of this inclusion piece? I mean, it's a, as you said, it's a team sport. Uh, they are kind of a bit like the, the captain. Um, yeah. What role do you see chairs playing in this? Yeah, so um, as, as you mentioned, not, not narrowly part of the scope uh, of the review beyond um, you know, the appointment processes for chairs. Um, but look, as part of my day job, I uh, go around and meet uh, the, the boards of the different regulated entities that, that we're involved with. Um, and it's, you know, just spending an hour, hour and a half uh, with a board is very insightful uh, 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 to observe the dynamics and, um, you know, the importance of the chair drawing in 
uh, other board members and really utilizing the full, you know, the full resources, capacity, perspectives uh, around um, the table. So, you know, that role of the chair um, directing traffic uh, and, and drawing in and, and utilizing that full capacity is, is something that I notice when I um, go around and, and visit these boards. And, and there's a, you know, there's a spectrum of practice um, there across the industry. Which you're also saying should be documented too, of course. And precisely, yeah. Um, hey, the other thing that's that's fascinating about your report is the focus on, and you mentioned this in, in your remarks this morning, that boards increasingly need to see themselves as kaitiaki or stewards of their companies and being responsive to the the, the list of, of um, rapid rapidly changing circumstances you outlined. For the Institute of Directors in our top five issues, we call that board agility. Um, and within that, you point to Te Ao Māori as one of the areas of change. And I know that the Reserve Bank in New Zealand has been working pretty hard in that mm. area itself, let alone uh, working with um, some of the, the entities that you regulate. How do you see that playing out for boards, given you mentioned that in the report as, as one of those sort of rapidly changing pieces mm. of the situation that people are working in? Yeah, so, so something that we've um, thought about a, a lot. Um, again, it wasn't wasn't um within the scope uh, of the review as such but you know you do make observations in, in the sidelines um you know we're really encouraged by the increased focus on te ao maori across the financial industry and, and some of the efforts that we're seeing um we've seen um te ao maori strategies being published by uh you know uh, organizations and seen a real you know focus there um some actions recently, such as the, um, you would have seen uh, Kiwi Bank's announcement around its approach to, to business lending to Māori businesses and how they're evolving their practice to, to both manage the risk, but uh, also increase um, access. So we're seeing some, some concrete things um, in those organizations and that's really encouraging. And that's something that we've collaborated with uh, the industry uh, a lot. Um, what you're seeing, um, but then when you ask the, uh, you know, the staff that were part of the review and, and interacted with the boards, much less uh, traces of um, a te ao Māori perspective around the board table. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's there in the organisation um, and, and, and some of those outcomes, but less signs of it uh, having a strong prominence uh, around the board table. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's an important observation because these things do have to be led, you know, led from from the top and set the tone um, and the culture. Uh, and just to give you a concrete example of that, um, I've been meeting boards for, uh, you know, a couple of years now, and it was only this week was the first time that um, I was in a board with a karakia being recited. Um, so that, you know, that seems to me like, you know, some of the basics. Um, and even when we get to a stage where um, boards are, uh, you know, thinking about karakia and whakatoki and um, trying to integrate uh, tikanga Māori into, into their practice, you know, that's really just getting to the start line uh, in terms of um, uh, embedding, uh, you know, a deep um, te ao Māori perspective uh, across governance more generally. You've said an interesting thing, actually, in, in, in your remark just then, which which dovetails with some of the findings in the report around diversity, which I think is a really important lesson for everyone on the call today, not just in the financial sector, which is if you've got a bunch of policy for your organisation, for your company, um, that's being followed through, whether that's in terms of diversity, te ao Māori and, and, and tikanga and so on, the way you've described, um, it's pretty important that that gets demonstrated by the, the board table. So more um, uh, do as I, I, I do as opposed to do as I say, I think is, is a pretty important lesson out of what you've talked about. Um, we've got a few questions from uh, from our audience and I would encourage others if uh, you have burning questions to put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. So one of them, Christian, is did you assess how well conflicts are managed for executive director conflicts and were there any good practice lessons? Hmm. So, yeah, so conflicts of interest was one area of the report where we thought, um, you know, practice was pretty good, uh, actually, and, and and somewhere where it's, 
you know, something that's been front of mind for boards for for a long time. It's something that's reasonably well documented. Um, you know, something that uh, is regularly reviewed and updated because those conflicts do evolve. For 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 the executive directors, uh, you know, the key one for us is around independence, um, and that really comes from the fact that a large part of our financial industry is um, foreign owned uh, and will have parents uh, overseas and those parents will appoint executives uh, as board members on our boards. And so those conflicts are, are really crucial um, for us when we think about how those boards, uh, the dynamics around those board tables. Um, the, the key one being, uh, you know, if there's a shock that puts the, the financial stability of both the New Zealand entity and the parent entity at risk at the same time, uh, you know, how are those executives going to manage that conflict at that point? Uh, and that's really crucial because uh, it's kind of why we, you know, why we have a focus on financial stability is for those rare, rare extreme events that can put stress on the financial system. So that's something we put a lot of focus on. Um, and it's probably why um, in terms of our guidelines and policies and things, um, independence is the one that's probably articulated the most most fully and and has you know some particular metrics uh, around it. Yeah, which which goes to the heart of what you were trying to do with the um, entity separation and the capital requirements for for the domestically focused subsidiaries, even if they're that's owned right. offshore. And it, as you've said that, it kind of really does reinforce the point you made in your remarks, which is this governance stuff actually matters for financial stability, um, because if some of those capital requirements and so on were undermined by uh, some of those conflicts, uh, then we actually know further ahead in terms, in terms of achieving that wider financial stability objective. It, it's interesting. I mean, I guess the other dimension to this is some of the financial sector firms are not for profits. Um, and so we've got a question from one of the audience members, which is about how have you thought about or did you even see in terms of this review a difference in the governance approach, possibly even the, the quality of that governance between those for profit and not pro not for profit financial institutions? Yeah, so so in our world, um, you know, banks versus non-bank deposit takers is, is uh, you know a, a distinction in terms of that uh, profit and not for profit, um, and and what we um, you know what we observed is that there wasn't a, a you know a direct linear relationship between the size uh, of the organisation and the quality of the governance. That that was one thing uh, that we observed. So. Um, you know that was one observation. We are conscious that um, a lot, a lot of the aspects of the financial industry, there are economies of scale. So, uh, you know, e everyone has to have good, good governance, and all that requires an investment in the same way that investing in good systems and IT and um, processes and um, frameworks across the organisation requires a, a fixed. Investment, so so we are are conscious that it does create a, a tough environment for smaller um, institutions, and that's where some of the the non bank deposit takers um, fit in. Uh, as part of the Deposit Taker Act um, that's just been passed, um, we have a requirement to think about proportionality, so take a proportionate uh, approach, um, recognizing that different entities are of different size and are of different um, systemic importance, so don't necessarily have to have exactly the same um, requirements. Um, that said, uh, you know, that proportionate approach uh, might be able to provide some stability, uh, sorry, some some simplicity, so we might be able to make it more simple, um, but we do still need to have strong confidence that it's going to provide that stability uh, and soundness and, you know, things like... Um, independent evaluations of, of boards is just a, a kind of going to need to be a fundamental requirement regardless, you know, regardless of your size. We hope that things like um, this thematic report, uh, you know, it's kind of free consultancy for smaller organisations if they, you know, want to see what, what good practice looks like um, out there. So we help, hope we can be helpful in that sense. Uh, we also every six months hold um, director and senior officer workshops 
So that's an ability to to get it, get all the key um, decision makers in the industry together, and and again just um, uh, enable some of the smaller organisations to um, you know get that uplift of 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 being close to uh, that type of thinking. Yeah, it's interesting the economy of the scale point you made, and I guess you know it's one of those things we we periodically get not for profit chairs, for example, together from a whole range of sectors. Um, and, and in most recent conversations, they've re-emphasized the point with us that actually there's a level of complexity in the not-for-profit side of that. You don't get some of its economies of scale, but some of its ownership, some of its membership, mm. that kind of that kind of idea as well. Um, there's a question from the audience, which is kind of furthering the, the earlier part of our conversation about institutional memory. And, and we talked and, and you've highlighted in the report the documentation of some of the the good practice governance or the practices of governance in, in various of these entities. Did you explore other ways of kind of retaining that institutional memory or passing it on? Uh, not, uh, yeah, not, not really within scope uh, of of the review, but um, uh, just to say that that documentation of frameworks and um, practices and policies you know is going to be a good good chance uh, to do that and and to review those you know regularly and that's really that opportunity to uh, make sure that they're fresh and that they've benefited from the lessons learned from those uh, around the table uh, also having exit you know exit interviews with those people who are um, have been part of the board but aren't going to be part of the board um, as well. Um, but I, I'm sure that there are a much, you know, a broader spectrum of ways to to really embed that institutional memory, but just to, um, you know, acknowledge that it is absolutely part of that, you know, being being adaptive, as, as you call it, um, and, and being a good kaitiaki, as I've mentioned. Yeah, there's an interesting point in there, I think, in terms of, and somebody, some, something I read actually recently, which suggested that even experienced board members going to a new board, can often find it difficult to be in, included uh, mm. in that board, and most often I think that's because of the um, the processes and and the and the governance being used is just subtly different potentially between what those directors have been used to and and, and what that that new board that they've they've gone on to is, is actually doing, which seems like an odd thing. I mean, it seems seems like it's one of those things where you'd think governance was governance, but actually the practice of it, and I think you find this in the review too, is actually subtly different between these organizations which in part goes back to the role of the chair and the way that we were talking about earlier but also things like induction yeah and we did we did find that induction was uh pretty good across the industry it was something that that boards uh were, were pretty deliberate around and there were um strong induction processes so that that is part of the you know the solution um that you're thinking about i mean to me also uh just that point that Every time you have a new member of the board or a member of the board changes, you have a new, completely new set of dynamics there, uh, and just the the importance of really doing that reset in terms of you almost need to do your do your the part of the induction needs to be team building for um, all uh, directors in that that new environment, given that you are a new team, given you have a new member. Yeah, but we've now got a couple of questions on um, the the observations you've made around around board, board subcommittees, um, and I guess there's two parts to it. One is, what did you find and the team find in terms of um, that lack of robustness and succession and appointment? How did that affect the functioning of the committees? Um, and how do you know how should these boards be thinking about the skill mix of, of those committees to keep them fresh and effective and so on? Mm. So the review was, you know, large, a a more more full blooded, fulsome review would have really got into the outcomes, you know, and and measuring some of those outcomes, and and the scope of this review was a, a more modest one, which was around, um, you know, frameworks, processes, procedures, just to give the best chance of that outcome, you know, occurring. So we didn't get into sort of concrete evidence around, um how that uh, lack of succession planning and lack of deliberate um, appointments had concretely um, you know created created different outcomes um, but but absolutely you know gives it the best best chance uh, as possible uh, to happen 
um, just having that deliberately, you know, th- uh, once again, just thinking about how um, the skill set across across the committee, you know, combines. And what one of the findings was really, you know, a lot of this was being done in an app, in an informal basis by the chair, not being well documented, and it didn't really seem to give the best chance to to make that make those decisions and those import appointments in a really robust way that gives the best chance of success into the future. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, and, and it does matter. Um, there's a related question, um, which I think has broader application, um, which is about boards seeking independent advice and you can kind of see boards seeking independent advice on some some technical things i guess although i'm interested to hear your observations about that um but when it comes to things like performance succession i suspect that's even more of an also ran in terms of of seeking independent advice so do you have a sense that boards are or aren't seeking independent advice in the financial sector? Um, if they're not, what do you think drives that? And if, um, if if some of that's about ego or nervousness or being shown up or something, what sort of uh, ideas do you have to to fix that? And you know how to how to get boards get over that? Yeah. Um. So you know we encourage uh, ex, you know boards receiving external advice. On matters, you know, we acknowledge that even if a board is um, has a responsibility and accountability for you know the functioning of the organisation, they're not. You can't expect them to have skills uh, right across the piece that um, you know relate to every aspect of the the, the running of the organisation. So there will be um, instances where they do need that um, technical advice um, coming in from the outside. Um, what we observed with succession planning was, um, you know, often uh, boards weren't uh, even using third parties to to go out and search, you know, spreading the search beyond um, people in the governance world that they already know or have relationships with. So just that simple point of um, using a, a third party to really open up the net uh, much broader than their um, personal networks. Um, encourage them and, and be part of that process of flushing out exactly uh, you know the nature of the skills that they're looking for and, and giving the best chance of success for for finding those. Um, in terms of the you know the inhibitors it can be you know as I mentioned right at the the beginning of the conversation we were um, positively surprised and encouraged by um, the openness and um, how um, getting uh, independent evaluation is becoming more accepted and and more um, uh, integral to the way that boards work. And I think that's possibly a, a maturity uh, aspect of recognizing that we're not, uh, you know, we're not all experts on every um, aspect of of our jobs, and and we can uh, taking taking advice is not a, certainly not a weakness, it's a strength. Yeah, and, and and that openness actually in terms of reflection and so on and so forth becomes pretty important. Um, just one final quick fire question. Um, you've talked a lot about that board evaluation, performance review stuff, and, and in some senses governance reviews of each each board. How often do you think boards, not just in a financial sector, but actually more broadly, do, do you think they should actually do some sort of fundamental review of their performance or evaluation of their performance? Yeah, it, it's a, it's a good question, and it's sort of striking that balance, isn't it, between that these things are um, time intensive. They do require a lot of self reflection, and you just uh, you know you need uh, some combination, I, I suspect, of of lighter touch, regular self reflection, even at the end of every board meeting. You know, having that board only time. How are we going? What have we how should we be, um, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, how can we operate differently just to continually improve? Just some of those simple practices uh, like that even starts building that openness um, and then you pick a pick a time frame where it's appropriate that things have, you know, evolved or changed um, sufficiently that you want to do that, that deep dive thorough evaluation. 
Yeah, there's real, real lessons for, for everybody around that. Well, it's um, time for us to wrap up the session. The time's gone really fast. It's been a really, really useful conversation. Um, there are lessons from this thematic review of financial sector governance that are useful for all directors and boards, not just those in the financial sector. Some of the major takeaways from the thematic review include directors and boards being kaitiaki or stewards of their companies that good practice is important and so is documenting it and finding ways to ensure practices followed through with changes of board members, including the chair. And finally, being deliberate about decisions on board member capacity, succession, and applying corporate diversity policies to boards. And that extends to Tikanga Māori from the conversation. It also highlights the importance of governance reviews, which is what we've just been talking about, and board evaluations, for which the Institute of Directors has a new set of tools, which we'd encourage you to have a look at and try. Uh, they're uh, ta tailored to each sort of entity, uh, worth going and having a look at the Institute of Directors website when you get a moment. And for all of us, I'd like to thank Christian and the RBNZ and FMA teams for their work on this thematic review, and to Christian particularly for sharing his knowledge and insights today. And to finish our webinar well today, I'd like to close with a karakia whakamutunga. Na inoe tato. Kia whakaria te tapu. Kia wātia ai te ara. Kia tūriki whakataha ai. Kia tūriki whakataha ai. Homie huie taikie. Ka kite anō.